Well, he is risen. He is risen. Amen. What a great Sunday. And I thought that we would start uh, this Sunday by reading. Here we are. Reading Luke chapter 24. And I, I don't know, I can't even imagine what this was like. But when I read the scripture, I always, uh, you know, you kind of get excited about hearing this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in the shining garments. Now remember, they walked in. Nobody's there. And then suddenly two men are standing beside them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his word, words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. In John it says that the two, Peter and the other disciple, ran to the tomb, and the other disciple outran Peter. But he stopped. He didn't go into the tomb. Peter being Peter. Bold, you know, Peter. Stoops down, takes a look, and sees what the other one didn't see. And, uh, and was able to say, he's risen. He's risen. It's true. And uh, I, I'm always amazed. This is my favorite time of the year, Easter. Easter is so exciting. And so we are gathered here this morning to celebrate what Jesus has done for us, that he's rose from the, the grave and he is uh, risen with us this day. And he is alive and he lives in us this morning. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead and he lives. He lives within us today. We thank you for all that you have provided for us. Help us, O God, to look to you this morning. May we worship you, Father, this morning in spirit and truth. May we realize how blessed we are and how truly happy we can be in the presence of God. And so, Lord, I pray that everything that we say and do will bring honor and glory to your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of things to remind you of. Don't forget that uh, Wednesday night is our last Bible study together. And uh, 1 Peter will be completed. And uh, we missed some of you. We know that it was, you know, like that week where nobody shows up at church. And <laughs> but, uh, yeah, spring break, it's time to get yeah, It's that time. And it's calving time and all that. So this is our, our last Bible study together for this uh, this year and so we're just excited for this season and we're going to start up in the fall we're going to have zoom bible studies again because it's a way for people to come together and not have to leave home and find babysitters and all that kind of stuff so we're looking looking forward to that as well and i hope that you have uh, made uh, your commitment for prayer for april remember we talked about that last week we want to make april our month of prayer and it's what you and God decide, not what Pastor Evan says, not what, you know, the ch- it's what is it that God has put on your heart. So if it means getting up early in the morning or staying up late at night or fasting for one meal of the, uh, of the week and praying in that time, whatever it is that God has put on your heart, this, this month we're going to de- dedicate to prayer 
And, uh, and so we do have needs. We, have, we, need, we need rain. We need rain desperately. And not just a, a downpour and a torrent and it washes away the soil. We need like a three, four, five day good soaking rain that goes into the soil and, and lifts up the water table. We need to pray about it. You know, and, and remember when you pray, pray expecting God to answer your prayer, right? So take your umbrella to your prayer room, right? Take your boots, you know, because if you're going to pray, expect, expect God to answer prayer. And uh, we need to pray. We need to pray for Myrna. We need to lift her up in prayer. We need miracles in our congregation, in the lives of people. And so, you know, uh, we need Michelle. Needs her prayer for her back, right? <laughs> God can do miracles, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. So we need that. And for Amanda, it's good to see you here this morning. And for others. If, and if you have, those requests come. Send them to us, and we'll send them out so people can pray. Yeah, you're not in this by yourself. All of God's people and God himself is here for you this morning. So let's pray. We're going to worship together. We're going to turn it over to the guys, and we're going to worship this morning. I heard the first song. You, I, I'm telling you, be ready. It's Easter day, and it's a sunny day out, and it's a happy day. So if you want to stand, you can stand with us. If you're going to be singing along while standing, though, uh, please, please, please put your masks up. Um, but if you don't really know the song, just clap along. It's all good. It's all good. So it's a happy day. If you want to stand, you can stand. Again, if you want to sit, that's all right, too.
and let's give a, a round of applause for, for our guy. And he is risen indeed. It is Easter Sunday, 
It is the first Sunday of the month. It is Communion Sunday. What a wonderful Sunday to celebrate Communion. Reminds us of the real reason for Easter, for Good Friday, for Christmas. Jesus Christ, our living hope. The one who, who gave all for us. As we partake in communion this Sunday and remind you that as you come to receive or to take your emblems to come up, we'll... We started on this side last time, so we'll start on this side this Sunday. <laughs> but to put your masks on to come, family at a time, a row at a time. Receive, take your emblems, return to your, your seats, and then we will, we will take, partake together. Paul writes to the Corinthians, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Till he comes. We join with John the Revelator at the end of his book of Revelation and we say, even so, Lord Jesus, come. As difficult as it is for us sometimes when we look around and we see our kids, we want them to grow up and we want them to have full lives. But even so, Lord Jesus, come. We look forward to his return. We look forward to his coming back to be with us. So as the boys lead us in song this morning, I should say, it's the young men, because that's what they are. The young men lead us in worship this morning. As lead, sing this song. I invite you to come, partake this morning. Take your emblems back to your seats.
Last night, Sharon and I watched uh, three uh, episodes of The Chosen, the last three, and uh, knowing that today was Easter, I'm watching it and the tears are just... He heals the leper when no one wanted anything to do with lepers. He talked with Nicodemus, and to see a teacher of the law kneel and kiss the hand of the Son of God, to see him deal with the Samaritan woman as she rejoices and runs to the city. He told me everything about my life. I loved it when she said, I, I'm going to go tell everybody. And the player, person who's, who's playing the part of Jesus says, I was kind of hoping you would. It's our, it's our privilege to tell the story of Jesus Christ, our living Lord. When he had finished supper, he, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let's do in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same manner, he took the cup. After they were eating, he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. This do in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Father, we, we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, the one who gave his life for us, the one who who shed his blood for us, the one who, who made a way that we could come into the presence of God. Our sins could be forgiven. Father, I pray this morning that our worship would be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear and our love would be a sweet smell, that it would be our offering upon the altar of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. May we always remember that it's always been about you. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. Fear is gone. Be 
Kids, if you want to go downstairs. I'll tell you one little secret. I will be so glad when I don't have to wear the mask anymore. I am spending half my life wondering if I'm losing my sight or if it's just my glasses fogging up. And they fog up enough on their own without adding a mask to it. So uh, I will be extremely excited when I don't have to wear that thing anymore. Well, this morning... Because we didn't have a Good Friday service and uh, our ministerial Good Friday service couldn't happen and all that good stuff, 
I was thinking through the week, Lord, what is it that, what is it that we need to, to remember? And what kept coming back to me was that it's all part of God's plan. It's, we, we wander through life and we struggle with things and we, you know, some of the things that we struggle with are of our own making and some of the things that we struggle with are just simply life. And uh, we have the joys, we have the highs, and we have the lows, and we have all of that stuff that is in between the days that just seem to be one after another and doesn't seem to be a whole lot of, you know, well, this was a great day or this was a horrible day, it's just it was another day. And we live through all of that. And I thought about, I said, God, what, a, what is this all about? And he reminded me that it's all part of the plan. We don't necessarily see the whole plan. I was thinking of my neighbor who just loves to quilt and uh, how she, she takes the time, you know, like, I mean, I just want, I, I want you to think about it, ladies. I don't know how many, do we have any people here that quilt? Because I, I don't want to offend you too much, a little bit sometimes. But I think it's probably the most insane thing women do. <laughs> take perfectly good pieces of cloth and cut them into itty bitty pieces and then sew them all back together again. I mean, that's almost as, 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 as thoughtless as, as, as sometimes ridiculous as men taking cars that are broken down and people have thrown away and then rebuilding them into something new, you know, like those, at least, at least when you're rebuilding a car, you know, you're not cutting the car up into little pieces. <laughs> well, sometimes you are. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's right. Yeah, sometimes you are, right, Bruce? <laughs> you are cutting the, and putting it back. But I want you to think for a moment, and I'm using this illustration to start, I want you to think about your life for a moment and think about how many times God has seemingly taken our lives apart and then put them back together. And seemingly sometimes we're in the process of them being taken apart. But when he puts it all back together, how beautiful our lives truly are when we've been following his plan. And so that's what I want to share with you this morning about how Jesus' life from death to resurrection was all part of the plan that God had laid out for our, us to come to a place of having salvation and eternal life. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word how marvelous it truly is to us. How, as we look into your word, and as we allow your Holy Spirit to, to speak to our hearts using your word, that we see the beauty of your plan happening all around us. And I pray, God, that, that we would just open our hearts to what you want to say to us this morning. And I ask, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. The boys, the young men sang this song this morning. I'm going to get it right yet. I am going to discipline myself because they're not. They're get, but when you get to be my age, you know, everybody's getting to be a boy. There was one song in that song, or one verse in that song that we didn't sing. And it's about, you know, well, we did sing. It was about the newborn, right? How many of you as parents, you know, and I look at, looked at your children and you're going, how are my kids going to survive in this world? You know? Uh, and, and now, how many of us are looking and saying, how, many, how will our ground kids survive in this world? And I go back to that verse about this newborn babe. But we can trust in Jesus. We can trust because he lives, right? Because it's all part 
of God's wonderful plan. And we start this morning, I want you to start with Luke 23, verse 13 to 19. And um, I want to start with releasing the eye of Good Friday when, when Jesus was in front of Pilate and it was, it was the releasing of Barabbas. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, this is what he says, I, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. And remember, they had brought false witnesses against him. And yet, he says, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. I just want us to stop here for a moment. Jesus, who had no fault. Barabbas, who was a terrorist. That's what he was. Barabbas was a terrorist. He was a Jewish terrorist who was fighting against the Roman occupation of the time. He was a man who had murdered, probably murdered uh, Roman citizens, probably stole probably uh, incited insurrection against the Roman authority of the time, there was nothing in this man that deserved leniency as far as Rome was concerned. He was a terrorist. I, I was thinking of this, and I came across, and I, and I quickly went, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a terrible listener when I'm listening to somebody preach because they'll say something. My son, unfortunately, has got all my same foibles. He'll listen to someone preach and he'll say something about a scripture and he'll go to it and then you might as well just be, you know, a bird tweeting on them because it will lead him down some rabbit path, you know. But Romans chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 Paul says this to us, and I, and I think about it as I think about this story. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, we know the story that Barabbas is going to be released to the to the people, because they were going to go into a mob exercise, which we call a riot, and, and they were demanding that he be released. And so who was going to take Barabbas' place on the cross? Even, even in this moment of Jesus' life when he was proved innocent he takes the place of a terrorist a murderer a thief and he takes his place on the cross we we aren't horrible people but but jesus took our place on that cross we deserve to hang on that cross because none of us are guiltless, are sinless, are faultless. And I, as I was thinking about this, I wondered about Barabbas. We you know, often when we portray Barabbas being released, we see him, you know, when we did it, leaping off of the stage just, ah! But I wonder if that was really his reaction 
I wonder if he looked at Jesus and he saw in Jesus this faultless man realizing his own guilt. I wonder if he come running off of that platform or if he kind of thought to himself, wow. We, we don't know. Scripture doesn't record anything more about Barabbas than this moment in time, but I'm thinking about if I was his, in his position. I would want to go over to Jesus and say, you don't have to do this. You, you don't. You are innocent. You, you, you couldn't meet Jesus and not experience the faultless, incredible love of God that just permeated who he was. You could overlook it, you could, you could push it to the side, you could allow your own prejudice to, to you know, submerge it below something else, but you, you, couldn't, you couldn't but experience it. I, I remember that when, when God's forgiven me. I, I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. Just like Barabbas didn't earn life, it was given to him for, because Jesus was going to take his place on the cross. I wonder if Barabbas followed the crowd out to Golgotha, to the road, and watched as Jesus was crucified in his place. I, I don't think I could do that. But if he did, I wonder what impact it had on his life as Jesus was dying on the cross. And he heard the centurion say, as the sky darkened and as the earth shook, surely this was the Son of God. We cannot come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ and walk away unchanged. We will either harden our heart or we will receive the gift of salvation that he offers. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But, but, God demonstrates his own love towards us in while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Amazing. And we see it portrayed as Barabbas is released. That's us, folks. That's us. We are the Barabbases. In while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were set free. I'll, you know, we, we may not have a, have a list as long as a person's arm down at the police station of all the bad things we've done, right? But none of us are innocent. We were all guilty. And then I look at the compassion of the cross. Luke 23, verse 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? Now, I want you to just, I need you to kind of get a picture here in your mind, okay? I'm sorry if I'm moving a little bit, but I hope I'm still on the screen. <laughs> you need to get a picture. When you are crucified, your arms are outstretched, you're hung up in such a way, right, that... If you are, if you need to talk, right? They nailed your feet to to the to this foot piece, right? So in order to talk, because everything is pressing down on your lungs, right? You have to push yourself up to talk, to say something. So this this one thief was so angry, he pushed himself up, right? And just like us, 
He's looking for a way out of his misery. He doesn't want to repent. He doesn't want to, he just wants to figure a way out, right? Like so, he challenges. Even the God, the divinity of Christ is being challenged by what, by what that first thief is saying. Just, just like Satan did in the desert, in, in the trials that Jesus went through. He challenged Jesus' divinity. He challenged his authority. He challenged everything about who Jesus was. And it doesn't end because Jesus is hanging on the cross. Satan takes one more shot at him. If you, if you are the Christ, right, then save yourself and us. And he slumps back down. And the other thief pushes himself up on his feet and he says, do you not even fear God? Push back up. Seeing you are under the same condemnation. Push back up for another breath. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and he says the most amazing thing. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This man has heard Jesus. Because who is it that introduced the idea of kingdom? Jesus. He introduced the idea of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Even on the cross, even while Jesus is dying, he shows compassion to the guilty who is hanging beside him. While one is challenging his divinity, the other rebukes him and asks for forgiveness. They didn't know how to, you know, when we talk about asking for forgiveness and, and receiving salvation, all of that was new to this, to this culture. And all of this was brand new. They'd never heard this before. Remember when Jesus, and I'm reminded of, this, of the, the video again, when, when the man is lowered down into the, into the house and he's, and you know, and the, says, I believe you are able to do this. I believe. And Jesus says to him, why is the Pharisees looking on with the two Pharisees looking on? He says, you know, your sins are forgiven. He says, which is, is easier to say? Take up your mat, be healed, take up your mat and go home? Or your sins are forgiven? For the Son of Man can do both. One is, one is only words and thoughts for his own survival. And at times he reminds us a lot of ourselves, doesn't he? Haranguing Jesus as both of them are slowly expiring on the cross. He challenges Jesus. We, we, we have a saying going around today. I, I don't know how many of you have heard it. How, some of you might have. It, how many of you have heard the expression Goat. Goat. Greatest of all time, right? Greatest of all time, goat. I always thought it was bad, but no, it's greatest of all time. And, and we, we look down and, and, and we see this in the sporting, the sporting air, arena, right? Like, you know, there's Wayne Gretzky. And he was called what? The greatest, right? Muhammad Ali. He was called... The great one, right? And, and we, we see, 
always, greatest of all times. They're always trying to figure out which is the best hockey team, what would be the best baseball team, what would be the best you know, football team, whatever it might be, greatest of all time. I want you to know something, that the greatest of all time never played sport. There is only one greatest of all time. And he died on a cross for your sin, for mine. He was the greatest of all time. Without sin, without fault, he had compassion on all he came on. He loved the unlovely. He healed those that people would turn their backs on. He took time to spend with time that people would shun the prostitutes, the tax collectors, all of those people that everybody looked down their nose on. Where did you find Jesus? You found Jesus with those people. Why? When the Pharisees confronted him about that, why are you spending time with these people? He said, what? The healthy have no need but the sick have need of a healer, right? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the healthy. I, I needed a healer. I needed a savior. I needed an answer to my, to my condition. Even when Jesus was about to take on the whole sin of the whole world, even when the father was about to turn his back on Jesus, Jesus still had time for the lowly thief hanging on the cross next to him. He had compassion on others when so many would only be thinking about themselves. This is the compassion of Christ wrapped up into this moment of time on the cross when he's hanging there. He's about to die for you and me. How easy it would have been to cry and to complain and to be bitter and to be angry at those who came to save you, to, that you came to save and they've turned their back on you. How easy would it have been for, for Jesus to look, look at Peter and go, you denied me three times. One of his very own hand-picked disciples turned on him for 30 pieces of silver. And what about the Roman soldiers that were around about him? Could they not look on Jesus and see his compassion? When he turned to, to John and he says to him, John, behold your mother. Mom, behold your son. Basically saying to John, it's your job now, John, to look after my mom. Right? He was thinking of others even as he hung on the cross. And he looked down through all of history and he saw me and you and he said, it is worth the price that I am about to pay that my kingdom may come on this earth, that it will be in the hearts of men. It won't be a political thing. It won't be some. It is going to be in the hearts of people. And then all the people that passed by him and reviled him and called him names and mocked him and scorned him. Everything. What was Jesus' final words to these people? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is this not the ultimate compassion that we see? Is there any better example of compassion anywhere at any time in all the annals of history, has there ever been anyone who has shown this kind of compassion? And I say to you this morning, never, never have we seen this. What, what an example he has left us to follow, the example of compassion. And then we need to ask ourselves this question. How well do I follow in the footsteps of him who had compassion for this world. We can't do what Jesus would do until the same attitude that lives in, in him lives in us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If you want to have the compassion of Christ, you have to have the mind and the attitude of Christ. 
And if you don't know what that attitude is, if you don't understand who Jesus is, then I suggest you need to read this word more. You need to find out who Jesus is. You won't be carrying placards. You'll be carrying meals to those who need meals. You'll be making a home for those who are homeless. You'll be looking after the orphans, the widows, the sick, and the needy, and the strangers in your land. For the compassion of Christ is not something that is just unactive. It is active. I can do no other because compassion of Christ compels me to do what God is wanting to do. Lastly, dispelling unbelief. Luke 24, 36 to 43. You've lost everything. All that you put your hope in is gone. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's going to work. <laughs> he came walking to them on the water yeah, and they were terrified, and he said, peace to them, and that didn't work very well. I mean, at least Peter said, if it's you, Lord, call me out, and I'll walk on the water with you. Yeah, can you imagine if he suddenly appeared in your midst? You're having supper tonight. You know, I don't know where and how you have supper, but if suddenly he appears in your house, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, peace be to you. Yeah, right after my heart starts working again, yeah, we'll get to that part. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? You know, sometimes, Jesus, you ask the most obvious questions. I am terrified because this has never happened in history before. Yes, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But who raised Jesus from the dead? There wasn't somebody coming along on the outside, you know, roll away the stone, you know. John the Baptist didn't come along. He's long gone. You know, no, this had never happened before. To the extent that it never happened to the, to the point where the body disappears and a whole brand new heavenly glorified body has been created in Jesus Christ. He walks through walls, peers out of nowhere, eats food. That never happened before. And then he disappears again. I'm thinking he eats food. I am looking forward to heaven because it's, you know, if Jesus ate food here, I'm not going to have to worry about my weight. <laughs> I'm not going to have to worry about my, you know, cholesterol level. Pizza town, here I come. And he says, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. That it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, have you any food here? See, this is part I like. And they said, gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and I threw away the fish and ate the honeycomb. No, and he took it and it ate in their presence. The one weapon that has power to undo a Christian, to undo, undo the gospel, is unbelief, is doubt. When we doubt God, we have lost our faith in what he can do for us. Jesus was restoring the faith of his disciples. And in restoring the faith of his disciples, he was destroying the unbelief that had entered into their heart. Right after this very, this very episode, he's wa the, the two disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, right? And he suddenly appears beside them, you know, probably behind them and caught up to them, you know. And he begins to walk and talk with them. And they don't know who it is until the very end when he says, he prays for their, for their meal. And suddenly their eyes are open. How many times have we been in the midst of something, we don't know that Jesus is there, and suddenly we just sense his presence. And all of a sudden, wow, 
My unbelief, my doubt is gone because I know Jesus is with me. I always wonder why people question the resurrection of Jesus. Because he convinced 11 Jewish men. If there is any group of people who are more questioning, more doubting, more skeptical in this world, I have yet to meet them than my Jewish friends. But I am telling you a little secret. When they believe, they believe with every molecule in their body. <laughs> you couldn't persuade them. When they see truth and grasp onto it, you can't change it. Right? I mean, the Pharisees were not just all bad. They saw the truth. They, they studied the law. They know, knew what was true. They just came to wrong conclusions. But could Jesus change their mind? Even the Son of God change their mind? Not a hope. Right? But he changed the mind of one Pharisee, Nicodemus. He changed the mind of another Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. Right? And what did those, what did that man do? What did Paul do when he grasped onto the belief of Christ? Nothing could change his mind even if he died. Today, the attacks of unbelief do not just come from the outside, but from the inside of the church. The word of God is under attack as it's never been before. And the attack is far more subtle and more deadly. It attacks the person of God. The father is no longer male, could be female, but it's been rendered gender neutral. We don't want to offend anyone. And yet, in trying not to offend human beings, how much have we offended God? How much have we offended God? Jesus says, don't worry about those who can, can kill a body. Worry about him who can, can destroy both body and soul. We are worried about offending a human being when we are maybe offending the God of all the universe all creation. And the history of the Bible is under attack. The legitimacy of authorship, the translation is being questioned, and even the basic belief of Christianity is being undermined. Not by the media, not by atheists, but by people who call themselves Christians. And they're bringing the one thing that can destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ into the body of Christ. And that is unbelief, uncertainty, questioning. But we have the truth. What was always considered sin is now thought to be as okay and cultural. We have abominations being put forward as normal, and disbelief doesn't just have to a toehold in the church. It's, it's running rampant. It's destroying people's lives. How did it happen? It starts with a complacent attitude towards the study and understanding of God's word. I don't need to study God's word. I just come to church on Sunday. Sunday, I'm going to tell you a little secret. If all you get from God's word is what you get on Sunday morning, you're not getting enough. You won't survive. Trust me. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a little deal. Okay? Everybody up for this? All right? You ready? Today you get to eat as much as you want. But for the rest of the week you don't get nothing. How well are you going to survive? No matter how much you eat today, tomorrow you're going to be hungry. And the next day you're going to be hungrier. And the next day you're not only going to be hungry, you're going to get a little weak. Well, except for me. I got a little... If our physical bodies need food every day, how much more does our spiritual body need food every day? We need to get into God's word. If you don't study God's word, if you're not open to being corrected and taught, then when, whatever you think is right, that will be right for you, and that is the philosophy of the world today. 
whatever I think is right for me is right. That's, that's not right. If this is the final authority on God, on right and wrong, then whatever I think isn't necessarily right unless it lines up with what this says. But how do I know what this says if I don't spend any time in it? How well worn is your Bible? I don't write in mine. Occasionally I do, but not very often. But I've had this, it's almost wore out. I actually got another one with bigger words. I can't see. We do not do the hard work of studying God's word to show ourselves approved unto to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. There is nothing wrong with you buying a notebook and studying God's word and putting the time and the effort that you need into so that you can know the truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. But the question is, do we know the truth? If we don't know the truth, how can it set us free? And if we question everything, if we have unbelief, how can the truth set us free if we don't believe the truth? There's so many things. It starts... The problem is it started with us living vicariously through other people's experiences. It was great. I remember growing up, having, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through this fast, okay? I'm trying. She's hungry. I'm just joking. I, I, it started, when I was growing up, we had missionaries come into our church so many times. And we would live, we would be excited about the missionaries and they come and tell us what God is doing in Africa or New Guinea or wherever in the rest of the world. But this was the question that I always had growing up. Why isn't God doing it here? Why isn't God moving here like he moves in Africa, like he moves in so many other places? What is... It is because we live our lives vicariously on the experience of others rather than experiencing God ourselves. Rather than experiencing the move of God ourselves. Right? You know, when you were younger <laughs> and you went to, to youth camp or you went to a youth convention and God moved there. Right? How long did that last when you got home? It doesn't last long unless you stay in the presence of the living God. Unless you continue to do the things that you had there today, here. It doesn't happen. So we didn't. When the hard times come, when tragedy strikes, when sickness invades, when financial ruin stares you in the face, we don't have that deep walk with God to call on to get us through. We may sing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. We read this this morning in our devotions. Uh, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. But do we know what it's like to walk with and talk with and share that joy with Jesus? We don't have that because sometimes, well, up until the last year, we became too busy. We were busy doing this. We were busy doing that. We were busy. I mean, I talk to people. I talk to my neighbors. They're retired, and they're busier now than they were before they were retired. Well, up until this last year. I mean, this, this COVID, as much as it's been a pain in the neck, has actually been a wonderful opportunity for the church to stop finding excuses not to spend time with God. What are you going to do? You can't go out. Even if you go to a restaurant, you have to go to the people with the people that live in your house. Well, if I want to do that, I'll stay at home. You know? My wife likes not to cook sometimes, but I prefer her cooking over going to the restaurant. When was the last time the Holy Spirit whispered in your ear and the tears ran down your cheeks and off your chin? And you felt this, this lump in your heart that felt like it was going to explode. You didn't know how to handle it. Just because the presence of God was so real in that moment. 
You didn't know whether you should shout or cry or be silent. You didn't know, but you felt that if something didn't happen, you were going to burst. You couldn't sing, you couldn't talk, you couldn't walk. The presence of God was so heavy, so real, so dynamic. When was the last time? If the last time was a long time ago, it's been too long. If the last time was last week, last Sunday, last Wednesday, you need a fresh touch from God's presence, His Holy Spirit. We need that every day. Jesus is in the business of dispelling unbelief, but you need to get close enough to him to let that happen. And getting close to Jesus can be uncomfortable. When you get close to Jesus, he's going to show us things about ourselves that we may not like, that we may not want to see, that we may not want to deal with. When we get close to Jesus, we will see the healings. We will see the miracles. We will experience the presence of God. We will have that intimate relationship with Jesus because he will dispel our unbelief and then truly, truly all things are possible to them that believe. What a wonderful Savior. Let me finish with this. It is important to have faith. It is important to believe. It is just as important to make sure that you believe the truth and know the truth. And to know the truth means you need to do the work, to search and to study the scriptures. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Jesus said these things. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But do we know the way? Do we know the life? Do we know the truth? And he also said that the truth will set you free. But sometimes the truth is hard to bear. It is hard to see. It is hard to take. And so rather than accepting the truth, we avoid the truth and we remain in bondage. Because it's easier to stay where we are than to change. God wants to change us. Not into, not so that you are all like Pastor Evan, God forbid, but so that you all look like Jesus. Not on the outside, but on the inside. If what you are putting your trust in is binding you to this fear, this, to this world, then you are subject to fear and you're subject to unbelief, and you're subject to this world. It isn't the truth. It's a lie. So it's time to let it go. It's time to be set free. It's time to find Jesus in a fresh way. It isn't easy, but it's simple. Jesus. What a wonderful name.
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And for that, we have all the hope in the world. What a powerful name. What a wonderful name. The name of Jesus. His name every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. Heavenly Father, on this day, when we have purposefully, intentionally taken time to remember the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We remember, Father, his compassion. We remember, Father, his willingness to take our place. We remember, Father, his dispelling all of the unbelief by rising from the dead. His resurrection set us free from death. And we are now, Father, sons and daughters of God with a hope and with a plan that comes from you. So Lord, I pray that you would be with your people this day. As they go from this place, Father, may they sense your presence through this week. May we intentionally, Father, seek your face to know you better. And I pray, God, that you would make your face to shine upon your people. You would make them a blessing and you would give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God go with you. God make his face to shine upon you. You are dismissed.